Empire or Humanity? What the Classroom Didn't Teach Me About the American Empire by Howard Zinn With an occupying army waging war in Iraq and Afghanistan, with military bases and corporate bullying in every part of the world, there is hardly a question anymore of the existence of an American empire. Indeed, the once fervent denials have turned into a boastful, unashamed embrace of the idea. However, the very notion that the United States was an empire did not occur to me until after I finished my work as a bombardier with the 8th Air Force in the Second World War. Even as I began to have second thoughts about the purity of the good war, even after being horrified by Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even after rethinking my own bombing of towns in Europe, I still did not put all that together in the context of an American empire. I was conscious like everyone, of the British Empire and the other imperial powers of Europe, but the United States was not seen in the same way. When, after the war, I went to college under the G.I. Bill of Rights and took courses in U.S. history, I usually found a chapter in the history text called The Age of Imperialism. It seemed that American imperialism lasted only a relatively few years. I recall the classroom map labeled Western Expansion, which presented the march across the continent as a natural, almost biological phenomenon. That huge acquisition of land called the Louisiana Purchase gave no hint of anything but vacant land acquired. No sense that this territory was occupied by hundreds of Indian tribes that would have to be annihilated or forced from their homes, what we now call ethnic cleansing. That classroom map also had a section to the south and west labeled Mexican Session, this was a handy euphemism for the aggressive war against Mexico in 1846 in which the United States seized half of that country's land. The term manifest destiny used at that time soon, of course, became more universal. The violent march across the continent and even the invasion of Cuba appeared to be within a natural sphere of U.S. interest. But with hardly a pause after Cuba came the invasion of the Philippines halfway around the world. The word imperialism now seemed a fitting one for U.S. actions. Indeed, that long, cruel war, treated quickly and superficially in the history books, gave rise to an anti-imperialist league. Reading outside the classroom, I began to fit the pieces of history into a larger mosaic. What at first had seemed like a purely passive foreign policy in the decade leading up to the First World War now appeared as a succession of violent interventions. At the very time I was learning this history, the years after World War II, the United States was becoming not just another imperial power, but the world's leading superpower. Determined to maintain and expand its monopoly on nuclear weapons, it was taking over remote islands in the Pacific, forcing the inhabitants to leave and turning the islands into deadly playgrounds for atomic tests. When the war in Korea began in 1950, I was still studying history as a graduate student at Columbia. Nothing in my classes prepared me to understand American policy in Asia. It seemed clear to me then that it was not the invasion of South Korea by the North that prompted U.S. intervention, but the desire of the United States to have a firm foothold on the continent of Asia, especially now that the Communists were in power in China. Years later, as the covert intervention in Vietnam grew into a massive and brutal military operation, the imperial designs of the United States became clearer to me. In 1967, I wrote a book called Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal. By that time, I was heavily involved in the movement against the war. When I read the hundreds of pages of the Pentagon Papers entrusted to me by Daniel Ellsberg, what jumped out at me were the secret memos from the National Security Council. Explaining the U.S. interest in Southeast Asia, they spoke bluntly of the U.S. motives as a quest for tin, rubber, oil. No anti-war movement in the history of the nation reached the scale of the opposition to the war in Vietnam. At least part of that opposition rested on an understanding that more than Vietnam was at stake, that the brutal war in that tiny country was part of a grander imperial design. Various interventions following the U.S. defeat in Vietnam seemed to reflect the desperate need of the still reigning superpower, even after the fall of its powerful rival, the Soviet Union, to establish its dominance everywhere. Was George Bush Sr. heartsick over Saddam Hussein's seizure of Kuwait, 
Or was he using that event as an opportunity to move U.S. power firmly into the coveted oil region of the Middle East? Given the history of the United States, given its obsession with Middle East oil dating from Franklin Roosevelt's 1945 deal with King Abdul Aziz of Saudi Arabia and the CIA's overthrow of the democratic Mossadegh government in Iran in 1953, it is not hard to decide that question. The ruthless attacks of September 11th, as the official 9-11 Commission acknowledged, derived from the fierce hatred of U.S. expansion in the Middle East and elsewhere. Even before that event, the Defense Department acknowledged the existence of more than 700 American military bases outside of the United States. Since that date, with the initiation of a quote-unquote war on terrorism, many more bases have been established or expanded. When I was bombing cities in Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and France in the Second World War, the moral justification was so simple and clear as to be beyond discussion. We were saving the world from the evil of fascism. I was therefore startled to hear from a gunner on another crew that he considered this an imperialist war. Both sides, he said, were motivated by ambitions of control and conquest. We argued about it without resolving the issue. Ironically, not long after our discussion, this fellow was shot down and killed on a mission. In wars, there is always a difference between the motives of the soldiers and the motives of the political leaders who send them into battle. My motive was to help defeat fascism and create a more decent world, free of aggression, militarism, and racism. As George W. Bush said in his second inaugural address, spreading liberty around the world is the calling of our time. The New York Times called the speech striking for its idealism. We can hardly ask for a more candid, blunter declaration of imperial design, but with assurances that the motive of this influence is benign, that the purposes are noble, that this is, quote-unquote, imperialism light. The American empire has always been a bipartisan project. Democrats and Republicans have taken turns extending it, extolling it, justifying it. The rhetoric, often persuasive on first hearing, soon becomes overwhelmed by horrors that can no longer be concealed. The bloody corpses of Iraq, the torn limbs of American GIs, the millions of families driven from their homes in the Middle East and in the Mississippi Delta. Have not the justifications for empire so embedded in our culture and assaulting our good sense that war is necessary for security, that expansion is fundamental to civilization, begun to lose their hold on our minds? Have we not reached a point in history where we are ready to embrace a new way of living in the world, expanding not our military power, but our humanity? <laughs>